Roosevelt with particular reference to the farm issue. On his return, he wrote out his conclusion. In brief, it was that the candidate's advisors understood well enough the nature of the farmer's plight, that the candidate wanted to do something about it, and that most importantly, he seemed to have the right temperament to handle a general crisis that was sure to come. Most of you here know the rest of the story. Henry Wallace became the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture in that very troubled time and was in charge of effective, at times even drastic action. You've heard about the cotton plop, we've had the pig killing. Uh, back at Des Moines, uh, Wallace's farmer carried on under the capable leadership of Donald R. Murphy, supportive as ever of measures for the good of American farmers, on through the strains of World War II and the price protestations in the middle 50s that saw the birth of NFO. There is an old saying that those who do not learn from history are doomed to relive it. In view of the recent rapid acceleration of disturbing trends in our national economy, particularly in the farm sector, it appears that we may still not have learned enough to avoid at least some of the history we're talking about here. I hope I am wrong, but I fear I may be right. Thanks, sir. <coughs> Our third speaker this morning is uh, maybe the best known voice in the room. It's Phil Allen, who does a uh, regular radio program for the NFO that's syndicated on 1,100 stations from coast to coast. A lot of you here have probably heard him for years. He was born near Sioux City here in Iowa and graduated from the University of Iowa and then went over to Omaha, where he was teaching at the University of Omaha and doing the nighttime news and editorials at station KIOL there in Omaha. And it uh, didn't take long before he got identified by the, uh, the uh, station manager as one of those goddamn liberals, and he lost both jobs. And uh, being an enterprising Iowan, he went up to uh, the United Packing House Workers of America and sold them on the idea of sponsoring him to do commentaries for them on radio stations. And they uh, agreed to do that, and he was on three different cities at the time. Pretty early on in the forming of the National Farmers Organization, he uh, went to a lot of NFO meetings and uh, spoke at many of their meetings as a labor representative. And at uh, one point fairly early on became, uh, began being co-sponsored by the NFO and the United Packing House workers together uh, doing commentaries on television about issues and their concerns. Wasn't too long before he uh, was, uh, became working full time for the NFO and was syndicated on 11 different stations at a maximum. And keep in mind, this was before videotape, so he was sort of traveling between 11 different cities in Nebraska, Iowa, and Illinois each week uh, doing these TV commentaries. In 1960, um, in 1970, uh, when the advent of videotape and much more expensive time on television, um, the NFO brought him into Corning with the headquarters and he began uh, taping um, three five-minute programs a week, which then now are syndicated. And uh, his main work is in Corning, although he lives in Omaha now. And uh, uh, you can uh, hear him almost every morning with the hog reports. And you can hear him almost every day giving a perspective of the National Farmers Organization on current farm issues, on consumer issues, and other issues that concern all of us here today. Uh, welcome, Phil. One of the most unusual introductions that uh, Oren Lee Staley ever received as president of the NFO was from Harry Graham, who was then the chief lobbyist for the National Grange. This was when Harry Graham had been invited, and so had Staley, and Ralph Helstein, who was then head of the old CIO Packing House Workers Union, as principal speakers on the Des Moines Register's uh, National Farm Institute. The National Grange had just become 100 years old, and at that time the NFO was very young, and Harry Graham was talking about the transients, the transient qualities of life, and how there are many farm organizations that come and go, and the Grange had become 100 years old. So he told a story about an octogenarian who was about to be married to an 18-year-old woman, and so the friends of the old gentleman uh, persuaded him to go to the doctor to take a physical examination. 
and the doctor gave him all the appropriate tests. And then the doctor said, well, you seem to be in good health. You're a pretty tough old boy, but I should give you a little bit of advice. If you're contemplating marriage, perhaps you should understand that marriage brings on responsibilities and perhaps a certain amount of physical tension. And uh, it, it could even bring on uh, the kind of tension that could be damaging to the heart and marriage could even result in death. And so the old gentleman looked at the doctor and said, well, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> so I thought I would begin with that because uh, last night, uh, Professor Fight was telling about the NFO shooting the hogs and the calves, and shortly thereafter, the price of cattle started on its way up as it did in 1974. And I know that if I would uh, confront Professor Fight on this point, he would concede, no, the NFO didn't die at that point. Uh, what happened was that cattlemen lost interest in that particular bargaining effort. So I would also like to begin my part of the dissertation by telling you that the National Farmers Organization in 1979 uh, did $700 million worth of business going under contract with the NFO to various processors, including all the big name ones in packing and dairy processing and sold to the uh, big names in the grain trade. I think it is fair to say that history is yet to record whether the NFO is, has yet achieved bargaining power. Some say that the NFO is functioning sort of as a marketing co-op and in precisely that way. It gathers the commodities together in collection points and dairy reload stations and grain accumulation points and attempts to get them in a block, bargain for the block, and sell on regularly scheduled, regularly programmed intervals part of that commodity under a negotiated system. Now the NFO has many troubles doing this and has made many attempts to refine this process. The NFO learned the hard way, and I was doing an interview with Fred Stover uh, about an hour ago, and we got on this point about the holding action and about the pre-announced price and the folly of all that, and Fred Stover certainly can see through that, and I think even the NFO sees through that, that pre-announcing a specific price and trying to get everyone to hold for that is an easy dodge. You just get a bit above that and then watch the, the block fall apart. The NFO's process now is to get the block together, to allow bits and pieces of the block onto the market at regularly scheduled, regularly neg negotiated times, and to teach and counsel patients. Well, enough about the NFO. I came to talk about the press. My experience has been in working with two different organizations that believe in collective bargaining, labor unions and the NFO. So I think that I have something perhaps that might be useful to say to you about organizations who are attempting to say something to the public even though you're convinced that the main current of the press is indifferent to your cause or is perhaps even corrupt. When Al Krebs was talking about uh, the pesticide people and the feed, seed, and fertilizer giants dominating the press, uh, you can't possibly overstate, in my estimation, uh, that phenomenon. For example, do you realize how many, how many commercials we've seen in the past several weeks where the whole TV set begins to rumble and then we hear heavy footsteps and they say, Bigfoot Lorsban. Now notice that Bigfoot Lorsban is not poisonous enough to poison those worms. It's big enough to stomp them. See, you've got to remember it stomps them. And then when they come on and say afterwards, who brings you this message? It isn't Dow Chemical. It's from Dow. You're to forget the word chemical. And you're to forget the word poison. This, I think, is kind of symptomatic of what farmers have to contend with the domination of the news media, and I claim to know the broadcast media better than the press, 
of what gets said. I have sometimes asked myself, supposing a farm director in a radio or a TV station would decide to do five programs in a row in a kind of a series of investigative reporting of what's going on in the terminal market in terms of competitive bidding. This was one of the big questions in terminal markets in the old terminal market cities. I can recount an instance in this and uh, illustrate to you how the press dealt with it. When the Packers and Stockyards Division of the USDA, uh, which has the authority to suspend or fine uh, commission firms or various people dealing in livestock in a terminal market, had suspended several in the East St. Louis market. I was then on the road doing this milk route that uh, was described here you by Mark, uh, going from station to station doing live TV shows for the NFO. It so happened that in central Missouri, one of our NFO members had received a clipping from his brother who lived in St. Louis, announcing the suspension of several dealers in the East St. Louis yards by the PNS Act for practicing false weights. They were being suspended for periods of nine days, two weeks, so on, as the penalty for stealing. Uh, the suspensions were announced during the Christmas holidays. In other words, during one of the most quiet periods in the whole marketing year for livestock. And this member of the organization I worked for looked for the announcement of that in the St. Louis Globe Democrat in his state cir statewide circulation paper and couldn't find it. And yet his brother had sent him the clipping from St. Louis, the city edition. Uh, city listeners wouldn't care much about an item like that. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't affect their lives much. But a farmer would be affected a great deal by that. So they sent the clipping to me because I went through central Missouri once a week to do programs in Jefferson City and Sedalia and uh, one at Quincy, Illinois, right across the river from Hannibal. And all of this in the area served by the St. Louis Globe Democrat. So I got on the telephone and called the paper and asked, did this item get in your statewide edition? And uh, they started on the um, sending me from department to department. One department would say, just a minute, we'll send you to the state editor. We'll see if uh, he knows anything about that. The state editor would say, well, I think that's in our farm department. Maybe the wire editor knows something about that. So finally, they got me to the, the department in a newspaper that's known as the morgue, the, the place where they keep the old copies and old photographs and old cuttings and so on. And the lady who kept track of that looked through all of the editions, the city edition and the statewide edition, and said, yes, that's true. That got in just the city edition, but not the outstate edition. And she explained it by saying that, well, our shipping schedules are such that we couldn't get it into the rural edition. OK, what if they're correct in that? Let me cite you some more examples from my memory of the way the press treats agriculture and treats organizations who speak for agriculture. One time when the NFO in its earlier days was watching the contracts of the feed companies in starting vertical integration setups. That is where the feed company would get farmers under certain kind of contracts, put them on a quota, furnish them the feed and furnish them the market and buy all of the product, thus taking away the decision-making power of the farmer. Uh, the early day NFO was sort of following along in a kind of a spontaneous boycott of that feed company. And our attorneys were advising us that this might be against the law to practice a product boycott if we were not organized under certain um, provisions in the law. I mentioned this one time on one of the programs that the NFO sponsored on a station at Faribault, Minnesota. The station manager said that even though I had not called for a boycott and had used weasel-worded words that they felt that from now on they didn't want any more programs 
written or announced by Phil Allen. They said they didn't mind having the NFO on the air on their station, but they didn't want any of the stuff coming out of Corning uh, written and announced that way, and by all means, their station was not on the air to help advertise any boycotts. Now, it could be that in the minds of some, perhaps that's right. There is a kind of an ethic that broadcasters believe in. Broadcasters believe that their facilities should be available to anyone who wants to pay for airtime to advertise a product, but therefore, they have sold somebody a kind of a right to a reputation. He's bought a reputation. So therefore, if anyone gets on their station and decides on, on their station to reduce that guy's reputation by arguing against him, that therefore you're kind of stealing from him because he paid for the reputation. Now, they don't exactly admit this in so many words, but it's a kind of a governing ethic in the broadcasting business. And I'm surprised at how many ordinary citizens, good, sincere folks, seem to have the same attitude. That if somebody is on the air advertising and is paid for it and has a nationwide standing because of a big advertising campaign and you attack that person, then you're kind of stealing from him. Look what violence that does to our concepts of freedom of expression. If this were true, and if book publishers, magazine publishers, newspaper editorial writers were immune from being criticized, then they would be sort of creating self-realizing monopolies. I think that the First Amendment to the Constitution very correctly says that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of expression and that in the practice of this, the laws very clearly allow editorials, news items, magazine articles to be quoted, uh, not at great length, but to be quoted for purpose of comment by people who are in the, in the business of broadcasting. I was asked if I would go through uh, the National Enquirer episode because I, I was involved in that, and uh, I'll, I'll be glad to tell you about it. First, I'd like to start back with about 10 months earlier when Fresh Horizons Bread was first criticized for putting, as they called, purified cellulose or wood pulp in the bread and uh, advertising it. And various people were criticizing this bakery, which is a subsidiary of ITT, Continental Baking Company, for putting wood pulp in the bread. I'm a kind of a do-it-myself carpenter, and I have a hobby of doing carpentry work. And I went to the lumber yard in Corning and bought a, the end, uh, the eight and a half inch end of a five by six wood beam, and I filed it down in the shape of a loaf of bread. And I got it very accurate, too. <coughs> I had to, had to buy a, a little extra piece to put on the rounded top of the loaf of bread. And then we put it back in the Fresh Horizons wrapper, and we, this is when we were still on the air on KQTV St. Joseph. And I brought my workbench that I fit on top of my table. And I put it on top of the table in the television studio with a, with a wood vise. And I brought a crosscut saw. <laughs> and uh, I sawed the loaf of bread. <laughs> and it made, it made a marvelous sound effect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So then we, uh, we did a radio program of the same thing, and uh, we developed some good dialogue. I announced to the radio audience that I am not really a carpenter. I'm just an actor, uh, pretending like I'm a carpenter, and I'm not really a baker either. And we broadcasted coast to coast, and the NFO reporter took a picture of me sawing the bread in the studio in KQTV St. Joe. Well, soon thereafter, a vice president of ITT in charge of Continental Bakery at Rye, New York, called the NFO and said that I had falsified. He said that I had given the impression that they use their forests, which ITT owns in Canada, to grind up the <laughs> lumber to put in the bread. And, <laughs> and uh, he said they didn't do that. They actually bought the purified cellulose from other sources and that it... <laughs> And that it costs 
it cost more than it cost more than if they'd made it themselves. So I said, well, that might shed some light on the efficiency of a great corporation <laughs> that you would be paying more than you need to. And so I invited him to come on the air with me on KQTV in reply. And then I spent the next couple of weeks, he said that he would. I spent the next couple of weeks consulting everyone I knew about uh, nutrition. I learned more about nutrition in two weeks than I ever had before. And I learned that uh, it's, it's part of the, the fiber fad. Fiber's good for you, you know. It won't cure cancer, but it might prevent it or with, uh, hold it off for a while. There's a question in some people's minds whether high fiber diet will uh, reduce you. Some people think it binds up other nutrients and they pass out of your system and they don't go in your bloodstream. So in that sense, maybe Fresh Horizons bread uh, was claiming to be a reducing bread. But the Federal Trade Commission made them stop calling themselves a reducing bread. And I think finally they had to include something on the label. I'm not sure how it all ended. But anyway, the vice president of Continental Baking finally phoned me and said no, he had to press of other business and he couldn't make it on the TV show. So he never showed up. Now this was 10 months before the National Enquirer did a piece on how cattlemen, how the uh, beef barons are gouging the public. You may have remembered that the National Enquirer, which has a privileged position in the grocery stores, right next to the checkout counter, had a front page story saying, beef ripoff, and they quoted a number of so-called experts, including me, and I'm sure a so-called expert in that case, as saying that the cattlemen deliberately, at some given moment, had gotten together and decided to sell off their herds, liquidate their herds to force the price of beef up, therefore gouging the public. The reason that I think that the National Enquirer story and our Fresh Horizons bread story were related is that the page on the NFO reporter is on this side of the paper showing me sawing the bread. If you flip that page over, the next page has a headline on it saying, NFO cattlemen gather for a cow sell-off, something like that to force up the price of beef. In other words, here's the NFO boasting that they're deliberately selling off cattle or having their members sell off their, their heifers in order to reduce the herds to raise the price of beef. So one quiet day in the summer, the phone rings in the NFO office, and this is at the time when Devon Woodland, the new president of the NFO, is in China having been invited as a member of a delegation from uh, the State Department. I think since Woodland is an Idaho farmer and Senator Church is important in the Foreign Relations Committee that, that uh, Woodland, uh, through his knowledge of Church, got to be the farm organization guy that went to China. So here's the National Enquirer wanting somebody to talk about the pri price of beef. I thought at the time that, well, since Woodland was out of the country and since the NFO, uh, Walter Hackney, who was the head of our livestock division, wasn't in the office that day, that they'd settled on me as the guy to answer. So they said, did the NFO deliberately try to maneuver to drive the price of cattle upward? And I said, yes, they did. And so we had a long conversation. And this guy sort of egged me along, complimented the NFO. I fell for it. We got to chatting with each other. He had a British accent, an Australian. I thought he was going to write a, a sort of an amusing feature article. And I was so dumb about the National Enquirer that I thought, well, maybe it's like Playboy. I had seen it near the checkout counters, but I'd never bought a copy. And I thought, well, it has some lurid pictures. You can see them and maybe one or two feature articles. I didn't know that it was a hatchet job paper all the way through until his article came out. They had quoted me as the NFO source, and they had quoted me as saying it was a calculated game, farmers selling off their herds to raise the price, that they reaped whirlwind profits, they reaped a price bonanza, and I got to saying, now I don't use expressions like whirlwind profits or price bonanza.
I may have said the calculated game. Our joke around the NFO office was that we'd finally found a publication crummy enough to credit the NFO <laughs> as being the only reason cattle prices went up. <laughs> they also talked to Gene Futrell, who is the extension economist for Iowa State University, and they had talked to uh, an economist at the University of Nebraska, and they had talked to an economist for the National Cattlemen's Association, all of them pretty much in the same vein, uh, using expressions or being accused of having used expressions like crying all the way to the bank and so on. So their paper showed up, and I am gratified to tell you that there were the storm of protest over that one issue uh, transcended anything that I had thought it might. Uh, WHO Des Moines, the, BB, the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Com Corporation, the CBC, um, farm publications from coast to coast uh, wanted us to get set the record straight. And of course, the answer to that is that it wasn't just one fine day that cattlemen decided to reduce their herds. They go through this cycle over and over and over again. And the dynamic of it is that when cattle prices reach a certain point, when they sink to a certain level, and the cattleman goes to the bank, the banker looks over the cost sheet and says, no, with cattle at this level, I just can't finance you next year. So as uh, the organization called WIFE, W-I-F-E, Women Interested in Farm Economics, I went out to interview them because most of them were cattlemen's wives. They explained all this, and they explained that another thing very damaging was happening in central Nebraska, and that is that in the area that once was cow-calf country, where families with generations of experience in producing cattle and starting them on the way weren't being financed, the same banks, probably under pressure of bigger banks, were saying to them, with central pivot irrigation, you can start turning this land into corn land. And so some of the best grazing land in central Nebraska was going from cattle country into the very highly expensive, very high uh, technology central pivot irrigation. This is the kind of thing that can happen to agriculture, and it can happen because of the murderous fluctuations in prices. And trying to talk about it, on the air is very difficult because oftentimes the main current of the press will maybe touch on it lightly but then go on to some other subject. They won't really background the subject long enough so that people understand it. Now let me see, I would like to close, I, they handed me a note saying I had a couple of minutes, uh, with some fatherly advice. I've had experience now going back over 20 years or more in trying to get an organization's house organ, its radio or TV show, or its house publication in shape so that it will be read, so that it will be accepted, and so that it will stay on the air. And it seems to me that we should remember some principles that I know both Art and Al and Mark here all know backwards and forwards, and I think most of you who have been publicity secretaries in your groups also know, so I'm not telling you anything new, but it's very important. Your news story has to have the five W's. Who did what, where, when, and why. You can test this in your own mind. Take any little car accident story in the middle of an intersection, and if you try to tell someone, not necessarily print it, just tell them in your own words, without telling those five things, they're gonna ask you. John Doe got hit in the middle of the intersection at 10 o'clock yesterday because he walked against a red light. Now that has the five W's. John Doe, who? Got hit. Where? In the intersection. When? Yesterday. Why? Because he walked against the light. If you leave out any of those, they're either not going to believe you or they are going to ask you about it. Now the NFO has had to deal with this for a long time because the National Farmers Organization feels that how many members they have is a question that's like how, how many aces you've got in your hand in a poker game. The NFO feels that way. They argue about this at every convention. So that's one of the W's they can't tell you. 
And this, the NFO has to pay for this over and over again. Uh, sincere broadcasters, journalists, newspapers say, okay, if you can't tell us who or who you have contracts with or what, then it's less of a story and we can't give you the coverage that you deserve. I've uh, seen letters from sincere journalists saying that to the NFO. Here's another one, and I think this is good advice for any organization that's trying to get the mule's attention. And this is good, uh, good wholesome work in a lot of ways. When I was 31 years old trying to run for Congress, I, uh, that's in the Southwest District, I was the Democrat who was the next to the last one that Ben Jensen defeated. Uh, during the war, my father died of a heart attack, and he had been scheduled to run for Congress. So my brother, Sewell, who also died of a heart attack three years ago, was scheduled to run. But since uh, he had sort of been kicked upstairs to run for lieutenant governor when Al Loveland withdrew from the governor's race, then right after the war, they needed a candidate, and they picked on a guy named Allen because he had the name Allen Sewell's brother. That was me. And I hadn't lived in the district because I had been a broadcaster at WISN Milwaukee and I was fresh back from the Navy and nobody knew me. But they thought, well, his name's Allen, who cares whether he's the right Allen or not. So I would issue a press release every week and I would take it to the Council Bluffs nonpareil. And a marvelous city editor said to me, look, Allen, we've printed your press releases, but we can't keep on doing it because newspapers are not operated to tell what you think. They're operated to tell what you do. So why don't you go out and hire a hall and you do something and then we'll have to print it. Now I think that's important advice for any organization that's trying to get into the news. Remember that honest journalists, whether they are on one side or not, feel that they have an obligation to tell what you do. So if you're driving expensive tractors around the reflection pool in Washington, D.C., the press has every justification in telling what you do. And they feel very skittish about telling what you think. So a lot of people who organize for months to get a good demonstration together, and the NFO has done it, labor unions have done it, and you've got a real story to tell, and the public ought to know what you think, don't be surprised if they're more interested in telling what you do. I've enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. We have time for just, just a couple questions. Um, but he has questions or comments can just come to the, uh, the two microphones. Go ahead. Mr. Allen, I, I wanted to ask you, if, to your knowledge, uh, agricultural reformers or small farmers or anybody like that has ever successfully used the fairness doctrine in the broadcast media? Yes, I think, uh, are, are you hearing me all right on this microphone? Uh, yes, I think that the NFO uses it all the time. The fact that we're on uh, 1,100 stations all across the country is mostly because of the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, there is an argument going on now whether the FCC should abandon the Fairness Doctrine, but the mechanics of it are that Don Mack, who is the head of the radio division, sends out specific instructions to NFO people and says, go in to talk to the station manager, only two. Don't one guy go in, but two guys. Don't go in as though you're putting on some big pressure deal, like filling his office with farmers. But two of you go in and uh, understand specifically that you, that you like their station, you uh, like to listen to it, don't be unfriendly, but remind them that you know that they have an obligation. And say it in a nice way, that they have an obligation I think that the Fairness Doctrine of 1934 reads something like this, that the station must provide, um, make its facilities available on an equal basis to all parts of uh, subjects of public importance over a reasonable period of time. That means that a station has a reasonable period of time after they've covered you to say, well, we covered you for six months, let, we'll kick you off now, let somebody else on. That's legal. But they do realize that in order to keep their license, they have to live up to that obligation. And I think the NFO uses it all the time. Mo incidentally, most of the programs we're on are on free time. 
Any more questions? I'd like to ask a question, Mr. Allen. <coughs> Do you hear me over this? Yes, I can. Good. Um, is there a relation, a cooperative working relationship, between the NFO and the AAM, and for that matter, uh, the, Natu the Farmers Union? I'd be very interested. At the last several conventions, the subject of the AAM has come up because they're the ones who are in the news. They're the ones who have probably done the best job of getting Mule's attention of anyone. Now, I can tell you what Staley said of the AAM and what Woodland has said. Uh, Staley has complimented the AAM for getting the attention of the public better than the, uh, better even, uh, I think Staley put it this way one time, better even than the NFO did uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, there was a meeting for action, as the NFO calls it, at Des Moines, at the Veterans Memorial Auditorium, and Mr. DeBoer, who was a spokesman for the AAM, and quite a number of other AAM people were there, and the NFO knew they were there, and the NFO knew that they would speak from the floor, and they have spoken at most of such meetings, and usually there is an AAM point of view expressed from the floor at most NFO conventions. Now, where they differ is that the AAM wants 100% uh, of parity, as they say, and presumably they want it through legislation. The NFO attitude toward legislation is, uh, yeah, we have a Washington office. Yes, we're for usually the big coalitions of everybody but the Farm Bureau will be for this um, main concept in farm price supporting. And the NFO goes along with that but usually the NFO says, but if Congress can enact it, Congress can repeal it or modify it or gut it or corrupt it, and so can the administration. So for heaven's sake, get yourself in a position to bargain. Now that's the NFO's stance. They are friendly to the AAM. There are AAM guys at our functions, and I think some of our people are AAM. Some AAM people are NFO, but I think that's as far as they go together. Oh, one other thing. The Capra Volstead Act, under which the NFO is organized, says that farmers and ranchers, fruit or nut growers, um, in interstate and foreign commerce may act together collectively in domestic and foreign commerce with or without contracts for the products of persons so engaged. And I think that last phrase of persons so engaged has been taken to mean that the NFO may bargain only for its members. In other words, a non-member can't bring his milk into an NFO collection point and expect the NFO to sell it under contract. The NFO must always say, you've got to join first. Are there any, any more questions? Any more comments? One more here. Why don't you just speak up? I don't see anyone up in the booth. I'll just repeat your question. Is that so? I didn't know. And getting their support and getting a job done in Washington. Mm -hmm. And so Joyce Robinson stood up on the floor of the 
Okay. Thanks, Don. Uh, okay, any more comments, anything? All right. Oh, you want? I just wanted to quickly mention, I said in terms of supporting the, in terms of papers in the movement, that there are a number of folks here that, that are putting out publications. Uh, there's the, the Rural Advance that's coming out of the Frank Graham Center. Uh, there is the, the Food Monitor. And there's a paper that puts out, comes out from National Land for People, my own uh, AgBiz Tiller. And uh, those, those are the kind of publications. The, uh, the NFU Washington Newsletter, the NFO Reporter, are all publications that I think you know, we really need to support. Uh, the Family Farm Monitor, the National Family Farm Coalition Education Project puts out. And also there's a, a, a to be selective, and two, in terms of not having to read all the press, but picking out what's important. And uh, you'll notice in your, your packets, there's a leaflet there for a, uh, a clipping service, which self-serving, but uh, the, the speaker here, myself, and another friend are trying to get off the ground to provide a real source of information to rural groups on food, agriculture, land, and rural resource matters. We have uh, one brief announcement, then we'll take a real quick break and move right into the next panel.